And now we are recording. So where we left off, let's see. We made it through the primitive types, data members, declaration, assignment. Okay, arithmetic expressions. That's the right place. That's where we want to be. So we'll see how much of a dent we make in all this today. We should get most of the stuff done. So arithmetic expressions used in a wide variety of computations and assignments. There are four, five basic ones. So plus for addition, minus for subtraction. And make sure with that you're using a short dash. Like if you're making a... Uh, a hyphen in Microsoft Word, sometimes it'll go from a short one to a long one. So you definitely want to use the short one, just the straight one that's on your keyboard. Uh, uh, asterisk for multiplication, uh, forward slash for division, and a percent sign for modulo. And if you don't know what modulo is, it's the remainder after division. That one tends to mess people up a little bit, especially on an exam, which we don't have, so it won't mess you up so much. But you should know what modulo is. Basic arithmetic expressions, the syntax is you put the variable name on the left and you have some mathematical expression on the right. So something like variable equals expression. Okay, Let me put this as a slideshow. Everything on the right gets calculated. Whatever the result of that is, that's the value that gets assigned to the variable. So that's the uh, one way to do it, right? The most common way. Another one is an implicit operator assignment. That's where you're applying an operation to the variable itself. Uh, in that case, you do a variable, the equals an operator together, right? So plus equals one and then the value. So this first statement, x plus equals one, that just means add one to x. So it's shorthand for x equals x plus one. Likewise, minus equals two, so subtract two from x, times equals three, multiply x by three, divide equals four, x equals x divided by four, and modulo equals five, then you basically uh, do the modulo five. So divide x by five, and then x equals the value of any remainder. Last one, uh, increments or decrements, because you often find yourself needing to just add one or subtract one from a number. There's some quick shorthands for that, uh, plus plus and minus minus. And these, uh, by the way, are not just uh, simplifications for the programmer. They actually correspond to different faster computer instructions. So down at the machine level, there are uh, assembly language instructions for just incrementing or decrementing a particular uh, memory address. So this is going to do that much faster than going through the whole process of adding one to something. So that's a little, that's a little footnote there. Okay, back to my slides. Now, in Java, mostly arithmetic expressions work the same way you'd expect, right? However you do math on paper or on a calculator is basically how it's gonna happen in Java. However, there are some quirks. One big quirk is dividing an integer type by another integer type always results in an integer. And the reason is, if it weren't an integer, you couldn't store all the information, right? For example, if you had, uh, three divided by two, which in real life is 1.5, Java can't store that 1.5 in an integer, right? Because an integer type doesn't have a decimal portion. So part of that information is going to be lost. And the coder has to decide, well, is this going to be a round off or a round up or a round down or simply a truncate if the, uh, the decimal portion goes away? Well, in Java, by default, if you don't tell it what to do, it's truncation. That's uh, a fancy word for cutting it off. So if you have three divided by two, like in the slides here, that's equivalent to assigning it to one. Three, point, three divided by two is 1.5 in real life, but in Java, we throw away the 0.5. Likewise, negative three divided by two in real life is negative 1.5, but in Java, we throw away the 0.5 and it just becomes negative one. Okay, and then modulo returns the remainder from division. So for example, 12 divided, uh, 12 modulo seven turns into 12 divided by seven equals one with a remainder of five. So you do your third grade style long division and that's the result with modulo, whatever the remainder is. Okay. Let's go through another slide. Order of operations. Okay, we'll get to that. Let's, let's do a little Java first before we get into that, because order of operations is something that everybody should, knows, should know, but we all tend to forget it. So that's okay. So I'm going to finish loading up Eclipse here. You guys can do it as well. And we'll do a little math stuff. 
for example, let's do uh, let's do some stuff with a bank account class. Let's make that. So I made my 201 fall folder. Let's make a class bank account. I hope there's not already a bank account here. So let's see uh, bank account. We'll call it just bank platform. Okay, and that's going to have the main method. So the blank bank platform is going to have a set of bank accounts. So I'll give it an array of bank accounts. Now bank account doesn't live exist yet. So this is going to be this is going to be a bit of a problem. That's all right. We'll make our bank account. Okay. So bank account is going to have a couple things. It's going to have a string for the username and we'll have a number. Okay? So we'll use an int for the balance. A big integer and that's all we'll have at this moment. Uh, we could also throw in a thing, a couple commands here, like int get balance, okay, which is just going to return the value of balance. And we'll do uh, void credit that adds some money. And so for credit, we'll say balance plus equals amount. So we'll add in as a parameter a method or a value int amount. Likewise, void, uh, yeah, void debit int amount balance minus equals amount. Okay, so we should know enough at this point to understand this class, right? Bank account has a string, which is a slug of text. We'll have more about strings in a week or two. Has a number for the balance. We have a method called get balance that if I call that method, it returns the number, the amount of what the balance is. And I have two methods for changing the balance. So I have credit, which adds this amount to the balance, and I have debit, which add, uh, subtracts this amount from the balance. So for example, if over here, let's say uh, B equals new bank account, let's say 100 bank accounts are possible in the platform. And the very first one, I'll put in some comments for this in a minute, B0 equals new bank account. Okay, oh, uh, this dot B, so static, we'll make it static. So there's only one for the class, boom. Okay, and let's make a constructor for bank account. We'll do that. Okay, so here's our constructor method. And it's gonna take a string, name, and well, it's just set the initial balance to zero. I'll say, uh, and an int deposit. So whatever you throw in at the first, first value, right? However much money you throw in to start your account, that's how much you'll have there. So we'll say this dot username equals name, and this dot balance equals deposit. So that's how we'll create it. So over here in the bank platform, we're gonna create the new thing and I'm gonna make it, Doug will be the username and my initial balance will be $100. Okay, so good. So I can run this if I wanted to. I could say uh, system.out.println uh, account details. Right, so let's do, uh, we'll do another method down here. I'll do a method for screen dump. Okay, so void uh, screen dump, whatever my details are, and I'll send the uh, particular account. So I'll send bank account B. Okay, bear in mind, this parameter B is not the same as the array B, okay? Even though they have the same name, if I just refer to B, it's gonna mean this bank account. So I'll say whatever bank account I have, I do system.out.println b.username plus, plus b.getBalance. So it'll print out the name of the uh, account and the balance. Print out username and balance. Okay, so initially 
I create this B0, right? So I could call screen dump on B. Uh, I'll make it a static method, so I'll do the same thing. Static void. So it keeps things a little easier to code. Uh, Syst, uh, no, I just call uh, screen dump, sorry. And I'll send along B0, okay? That's gonna be that thing, okay? Quiet, dog. Dog, shut up, get in here. Go on, right. you can be in here. Sorry about that. He freaks out if he sees other dogs. We don't know why. He might be insane. All right. Good boy. You're okay. All right. See, we got dog. There he is. Dog. Okay. Back to where we were. So we're doing a screen dump on B, B0. Then we can do a B0 credit, right? We can add credit, say $250. Okay. And I do another screen dump. And then I'll do a debit, B0 debit. Let's take out, I don't know, $40. And then I can uh, print that as well. Okay, so we'll do that, that's fine. Let's uh, run it and we'll see all the output. Ta -da. So initially I have 100, that was my starting amount. I call my credit method, I add 250. So we see that pop over here, right? I do the credit method, adds that much to balance. And then we saw, I withdrew 40. And so again, go here to debit, I subtract 40. Okay, pretty easy, I hope. So questions about this. Does this much of it make sense what we're doing here? Any questions from anyone? Okay, really nothing? Let's see what's going on in chat world. What exactly is the function of screen dump? Uh, prints a status update, okay? So we can see what just happened. That's all. Like imagine if you had a platform where you did something to your bank account and it needed to show that the thing actually went through, right? So for example, you deposit a batch of checks and your account balance goes up by $1,000 and it says in some way, here's your new balance, right? That sort of thing. But here I'm just doing it for the demo of the math purposes. Okay, so a little bit of math, good. Okay then, back to, back to the slides. So that's basic math stuff. Now, so we understand the operations. But the next thing is the order of operations. So in some ways, same as algebra, but not exactly. So here's the thing. Uh, expressions in parentheses first get, evaluate, get evaluated first, starting with the most deeply nested. So parentheses within parentheses happen first, for example. Then in general, multiplicative operations, multiplication, division, and modulo happen before additive operations, right? Addition and subtraction and after that, left to right. So we'll have uh, plenty of examples at the end of the slides. Uh, we'll get there. But here are three examples of how order of operations is important. So this first one, right, five times three minus six divided by two, okay, we don't do it just left to right. If we just did it left to right, we'd have five times three is 15, minus six is nine, divided by two in Java would give us four, right? But that's not how it works. Instead, we say, okay, here are all the operations. There's multiplication, there's a subtraction, and there's a division. Well, multiplicative ones happen first, and it happens left to right. So the first thing we do, five times three, that's 15. Second thing we do, six divided by two, that's three. Last thing we do, 15 minus three, well, we get 12, that's our number. Second one, we have parentheses, right? So that happens first. So three minus six is negative three, Five times negative three is negative 15. Negative 15 divided by two would be negative seven and a half, but this is Java, so we throw away the half, so it's just negative seven. And the last one inside the parentheses, right? Division happens first, so six divided by two is three. Three minus three is zero. 
five times zero is zero. Okay, so order of operations matters. It'll determine uh, different results for you. Okay. Now, any of those primitive types can be returned by a method. If you're going to return it, you specifically need a return statement in your method that shows what you're returning. Okay, so I'll uh, bounce back to Eclipse then, which is a good example we have here. So, for example, in my bank account class that I just did, if I wanna return something, there it is, return balance. The method has a return type of int, balance is an int, I can return it, that's what it does. So over here in my bank platform, when I wanna read the balance, I have this object B, which is somebody's bank account. I call the get balance method on that bank account. And so this expression here is going to be an int, right? So the get balance method returns an int, thus this whole b.getBalance method call. In Java, that's going to be the equivalent of some int. Okay. So uh, we'll talk more about compatibility in a moment. And then by a moment, I do mean today. Now, typecasting. So typecasting is where you convert from one type to another, right? You say, this data is in one format, I wanna put it into a different format. So things like changing number formats is a very common one. Or another one is uh, enforcing object types. For example, if you have uh, a set of classes, say, uh, suppose you have a set of vehicles, okay, and vehicle classes, subclasses of a class vehicle, and you want to treat them as vehicles for some purpose, like storing them all in the same array, an array of type vehicle, you could typecast them that way. That would be one possibility. Uh, we'll have more to say about that towards the end of the semester. Anyway, so here's one quirk. There are default types for literal numbers. So a literal number is a number that you just type into your code. Like uh, when I do it here in Eclipse, right? This is a literal number, okay? It's just, I'm writing out the number 100, even though it's gonna be reflected as B0 dot balance, right? The balance of that object. When I write it here in the code, it is a literal number. I just throwing in the number 100. Same here for uh, 250 is another literal variable or a literal. So the default type on that, if it's a floating point number, the default type is double. If it's an integer number, the default type will be int, unless it's used in some valid lower precision assignment, or if it's too big to be stored in an int, then it'll keep it as a long. But by default, Java keeps uh, you know, reasonably small integers, like below 2 billion, keeps them as ints. So for example, byte b equals 23, that's valid, right? Because 23 is a number that can be held within a byte, which goes from negative 128 to plus 127. However, if I do this operation, right, five times 100, that is a literal math expression that uh, evaluates to 500. 500 is too large to be stored in a byte. Therefore, if I put that in there, you'll have an error, there'll be an error in the code. Okay, so I can show you that. For example, right, if I did uh, byte, uh, bx equals 23, that's fine. However, if I do it equals 500, I get the error. It says here, type mismatch cannot convert from int to byte. An int is too big. An int requires four bytes of storage space. A byte only requires one. I can't store this int type value. Can't store four bytes of data in a one byte box. However, if I typecast it, then it goes away. So even though 500 is too big to be stored in a byte, what you'll see is the byte will store the modulo value of this. I'll store the biggest fraction of it that I can, basically the, lower, the lowest eight bytes of whatever 500 turns out to be in binary. That's what I'll keep. Okay. So that can sometimes uh, throw people off when they're writing stuff. They're like, how come I can use this number? Well, it might not be, uh, it might not be small enough for the data type you're using. Okay, next thing, precision. So Java numeric types have a precision order. Now, if I tell you what 
you know, if I give, if I ask you for a definition of precision, you're going to say, well, how close it is to something or, you know, how finely grained it is, something along those lines, very precise. Well, in Java, precision is actually equivalent to being able to store bigger numbers. So it's not exactly the same thing. What it means, remember when I talked the other day is basically any of these numeric types, let's go back up to this table. Boom, boom, boom. Each lower type in the table can encompass all the values of the type above it, right? Any value that can be represented by a float can also be represented by a double, but not the other way, right? I could have 10 to the 40th, which can be represented by a double, but not as a float. So that's the precision order. Uh, okay, so all floating types outrank all integer types, double outranks float, long outranks and int outranks short, short outranks byte. So the order is all there in the table. That's the precision order. Now, you might ask, that's nice. What practical consequence does that have in Java? Yes. Well, the consequence is this. You can't legally promote a lower precision type to a higher precision type. Okay. Or sorry, it is legal. My bad. I'm just reading off the slides here. So if I have a byte, which only requires one data to store the number, one, uh, one byte of data to store the number, I can throw that into any of these other numeric types, right? I can say, oh, I have one byte of integer. I can store that in an int variable, which allows four bytes. I can store it in a long, which allows eight bytes. Now, this sort of thing can be explicit, right? So right here, I say double x equals double one. So I'm taking this value here and I'm typecasting it to a double. By default, one would be an int. When I typecast it this way to a double, Java is going to store this expression as a double and then assign it to X. However, because it's legal, even if you don't specifically code it, promotion like this happens automatically. Promotion means converting a lower uh, precision type to a higher precision type. So for example, double X equals one is actually equivalent to this statement above it. Now besides assignments, promotion also works in a number of other places. So number one, returning values from a method. For example, if I have a method that returns a double, it is perfectly acceptable to return an int from it. I'll show that in Eclipse. Okay, so here I have my balance. Uh, here I'm returning an int. We know that balance is an int. I can actually return a double and write it that way. And there's no problem because every int value can be expressed by a double. Of course, when I run this now, it's gonna show it as a decimal place because now b.getBalance shows a double. See, so all these, these are now doubles. They used to be ints, now they're doubles. Okay. What else? Uh, intermediate calculations in arithmetic expressions. Yeah, so if you multiply two different types together, there's gonna be a promotion to the higher precision type involved. And it also works for sending arguments to methods, right? So for example, go back to this code here. If I wanted to, I could send a byte value of 100 and it doesn't cause any problems, right? Because this method, uh, the constructor method, it accepts an int, but every byte value can be legitimately expressed in an int without any loss of data. So if I send along a byte, that's fine. It doesn't cause any problems. They're compatible that way. Okay. Now, that's my kids outside. They're being a little noisy. Children, silence, please. All right. Okay. So a mixed expression is one that contains more than one numeric type. Now, when you're evaluating them, Promotion gets applied to any result, if it's intermediate or the final result. And the result is always the format of the higher precision type involved. So for example, this first one, three plus 2.0 plus three, well, it's all addition, so it all goes left to right. So three plus 2.0, that's an intermediate result. It turns into 5.0. 5.0 plus three is gonna be 8.0, right? So that gives us our final value there. For the second one, three divided by 2.0 plus three, Division happens first. So three divided by 2.0, since one of the numbers is a double, that intermediate result is gonna be a double. So we have 1.5 and then 1.5 plus three, again, mixed expression. So the result is gonna be in the double format of the 1.5 would be 4.5. However, if I do three divided by two plus 3.0, 
three divided by two is the intermediate result. They're both integers, so that follows the integer rule of dropping the fraction, right? So that just becomes one, and then one plus 3.0 becomes 4.0. Okay. Now, demotion, on the other hand, demotion is permitted, but you have to do it explicitly. And the reason is, anytime you do a demotion, there's the possibility of losing data. For example, a double variable can hold uh, 17 or so places, decimal places, whereas a float, it's going to be like seven or eight. So if you have that, I mean, at most eight, if you have that uh, sort of situation, if you have a long decimal part, you're gonna lose some data. So Java's gonna say, you know what? You can choose to lose data, but you're gonna have to specify how the data loss happens. Uh, they don't have a random, they want to prevent programmers from making that sort of mistake. So demotion is permitted, but only through explicit typecasting. So this first example, if this 3.0 is a double, I typecast it to an int, I can then assign it to x. So int 3.0, it'll be assigned as three, since all the decimal portion is a zero, we just throw that away and it becomes three and everything's fine. But int x equals 3.0 is invalid because our IDE is not, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's not uh, precise enough to recognize that, oh, this 3.0 could be expressed as an int without loss of data. It's not even looking at that, it's just saying, you know what, this is a double, you're trying to fit a double sized piece of data into an int size box, this takes eight bytes, this takes four. We can't do it without losing data. You gotta specify how the data is gonna be lost. Same problem applies to method returns. So for example, if I had a method that returned an int, we'll go to Eclipse here like this. This method returns an int. If I try to return a double, I'm gonna get an error. And if I hover over that, you can see type mismatch cannot convert from double to int, right? Basically, if I can convert a double to an int, I'm gonna lose that decimal portion, I'm gonna lose some data, therefore Java's gonna make me decide how to do it. Okay. Now, arguments, we've seen examples, but let's go ahead, we'll go through a little bit more of that. Uh, if you're calling a method, objects and primitives, of course, can be sent as arguments. And the sent types have to be compatible with the parameters in the method header, right? So basically, anytime it's the same type, that's fine. If uh, the argument can be legally promoted to the parameter type, that's also fine, right? But if the argument would be demoted, it's going to be illegal. So you have to typecast it before you send it. And the same thing applies with objects, by the way. So any subclass would be compatible with a super, any subclass argument would be compatible with a superclass parameter. For example, if I say motorcycle is a subclass of vehicle, then if I have a method that accepts a motorcycle parameter, I could, uh, accepts a vehicle parameter, I could send a motorcycle as an argument because all motorcycles are vehicles. But it doesn't work the other way because not all vehicles are motorcycles. All right, so example here, uh, I have a method call a method description that takes an int and a double in that order. If I call the method with two ints, that's fine because this first one is an int, the second one can be legally promoted to a double, that's no problem. But the second one, 6.0, 7.0, that's invalid. 7.0 is fine, that's a double, but if I try to send this double to the int parameter, I'm gonna have to lose data. So it's gonna make me typecast that 6.0 first, be how I would have to do it. Okay, let's take a pause. We're gonna talk about some things in a minute. How are we doing? How's everybody out there? Are we good? What's happening? We got some chat, okay. Let's see, doing good? Good, okay, wonderful. Anybody have any questions on any of this stuff? It all makes lots of sense, I hope. Okay, well good then, we'll keep moving. Okay, so this one I used to introduce with a story. Uh, everybody knows what happens in Vegas, right? What happens in Vegas? Go ahead, shout it out, you know, you know the slogan, what happens in Vegas? 
Yeah, exactly. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? Except what? What doesn't stay in Vegas? No, your money's probably staying in Vegas too. Ha ha. Okay. The correct answer is herpes. That shit comes home with you. Okay. So that was the old joke. Yeah, exactly. STD. Somebody got that. There you go. So this actually has a parallel in Java. So if you send along a value to a method, okay, if you receive something, a numeric variable as a parameter, Java creates a new copy of it for that method. And then and I'm going to do this in paint because it'll show up a little better. Okay, so here's option one, boom, here's going to be option two. Okay, so numbers and objects. So over here, suppose I have a method, void uh, m, m is the method, and accepts an int x, okay? I'm gonna make that italics, okay. And in there, x plus plus, okay? Now down here, if I have some code, okay, and I call that method, if I send along the number three, right, we'll talk about that in a second. Suppose I have some int y equals one, and then m, I call m with y, okay? So this one, x is created as a new variable for use in this method, okay? it will have the same value as y, but because it's a new variable, no changes to x in m affect the original y, okay? So if I call this slug of code here, right? I set y to one, I call this method and copy y into x and then increase x by one, this y is still gonna be one afterwards, right? It's not gonna get incremented to two. And it makes sense when you think, right? Couldn't change the literal anyway, okay? So because this thing is literal, I can't have three equal four after this method runs anyway. So. Reason is, there's a bunch of reasons why you do it, uh, but the single biggest one is simply primitives tend to be pretty small. It's not a big deal to make a new copy of something, right? If you want to have it be the same thing, you would have it just be uh, a data field in some object. So I'll show you how it works with objects. Again, if I have a similar slug of code here, okay, so uh, suppose I have a class, I don't know, thing, let's call it, so void m and m accepts a thing t. Okay, and I'll say, uh, and t has an attribute uh, x, t dot x plus plus, okay? If I say, you know, uh, thing t1, now let's call it thing what? Thing z equals new thing, okay? z dot x equals one. If I then call M and send along Z as the object, okay, afterward, uh, Z dot X equals two, is two, okay, because it got incremented. So with objects, you send along the reference, you don't create a new thing. With objects, you don't create a new object copy, you just reference the object object through a new reference, okay? So this T here, when I call the method with M dot Z, this T actually is Z. Z is pointing to something in memory, T is pointing to the same thing in memory, so when I change T 
T's X attribute, I am also changing Z's X attribute because they're the same thing. Now, how does this bring us back to Vegas? Well, we can ask the question, are STDs numbers? No, they are not. They are things. They are represented, would be represented as objects. Therefore, right, this numbers changes to numerics, right, numeric primitives stay in Vegas, right? I change X here. It doesn't affect what happens on the outside, but changes to object fields do not stay in Vegas. They come back, okay? They affect the original. All right, I hope that makes sense. That's just, you know, that's just how Java is. And you can push the I believe button until you accept it, I don't know. Okay, questions on that? Does that make sense? So this is important to understand when you start writing methods, you'll know that, oh, I can't just send something to a method, change the number on it, and assume that it's gonna get changed in the original. On the other hand, if I change an attribute of something, yes, that will be changed. Okay, so again, going through this slide, uh, for numeric values received as parameters, only the value is copied, right? It creates a new value in the method a uh, new variable in the method. For objects, you don't create a new object in the method. You use a reference to access the original object. So changes to the object attributes do affect the original. Okay, constants. Numeric constants are enforced by the magical reserved word final. So if I have final int x, that means nowhere in the program can I make a change to that. And it works for objects or even classes in various ways. We can talk about that with uh, string later. String is a final class, means you can't make subclasses of it. So any variable designated as final cannot be changed. And this is very useful to present, prevent tampering or to prevent un, uh, unintended changes to a program. Uh, also for common variables, uh, common new numbers like pi and e in uh, Java's math library. Okay, so I can pop out to uh, Eclipse for a moment here. If I wanted to, here I could say final int x equals three. If I try to increment it, I'm gonna get an error here. It's gonna say final local variable x cannot be assigned, must be blank, not using a compound statement. Basically, once I set x with final, it's a constant and cannot be changed anywhere in the program. There are some math libraries in Java. Okay, the basic one, you'll see java.lang.math. If you need to do things like exponentiation or logarithms, it's great for that. Uh, there's also an absolute value function, or method rather. So it's automatically part of the Java language, so you don't need to import any other classes into your program, it's just there. Okay, so for example, if I wanted to find the, you know, two to the third power, for example, I could do system.out.println uh, math.how, and it takes two doubles, it'll be a to the b, so 2.0 to 3.0, okay? So it's right there in the Java language. I don't need to bring in any other classes to do it. Okay. Handy, if you're doing math stuff. Okay, so here's an example usage on absolute value. If you wanted to have a bit of a program that does a round off, so you send it a double, basically round off means to the, the nearest one. So if it's a positive number and the decimal part is 0.5 or above, it would go up one. If it's uh, positive and less than 0.5, it would round down. So one way, we, and it works the other way for negatives. So one way we can do it is, you know, basically add 0.5 or subtract 0.5, depending on whether the number is uh, positive or negative, add that to D and then do the int operation to truncate it. So for example, if our, if our D is one or say 1.4, D divided by the absolute value of D, well, they're both positive, so that's one. So we add 0.5 times one to our 1.4, we have 1.9, we truncate that to an int, so it just becomes one, that works. On the other hand, if we have negative 1.4, 
this is going to be negative 1, okay? Our 0 0.5 times negative 1 will be what? 0 0.5, negative 0.5, right? So for our D, we subtract 0 0.5, or we add, yeah, we subtract 0 0.5 from it. So D would be 1.4 minus 0 0.5. So once again, that'll get our negative 1.9 would get truncated to minus 1. Okay, good. So here's our quick knowledge check. This is what you should be knowing at this point, what you should be familiar with. What are the six numeric types, approximate range, and precision order? You need to memorize that for an exam, but here you should be familiar with it, understand the concepts. Uh, number two, the five arithmetic operators, right? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulo. And you should know the order of operations, okay? What are demotion and promotion? When are they valid? How are mixed expressions evaluated? And then how are objects and primitives handled differently when they're sent as method arguments, right? So primitives, you make a new copy for use in the method, it becomes garbage afterward. Objects, you send along an object reference, changes to attributes of the object, right? Within that method, affect the original. That's the difference. Okay, and all the rest of this, I have a bunch of practice problems. So I'm going to encourage all of you to do these over the weekend. And when we roll in on Monday, that'll be the first thing we discuss. Okay, so take a few minutes to go through these and check your understanding of how Java math works. Okay, there's some good ones in there. All right. So I'm gonna stop the recording. Let's see who has any, anybody have any questions? Questions on any of this stuff? I'm gonna end the screen sharing. How are we all doing? Questions, anybody? Yes, all lectures will eventually be uploaded. Yes. And I may be short uh, Wednesday's lecture, so I'll have to upload that as well, probably, yeah. No questions, all this makes lots of sense. I hope it does. Okay, so uh, today I'm gonna post the first homework assignment. Uh, we'll see how it, uh, the TA situation, but is the lab graded on accuracy? Not to start with. Okay, these first ones, these first lab exercises are just for practice, okay? Future ones, may consider accuracy, okay? Uh, the lab is due today, that is correct.